Hi there, students. I hope you are all doing well. Now, moving on to the next segment of our environmental law discourse, we'll discuss certain laws, um, facets relating to forest conservation in India. Now, as you all know, that the forests are a major natural resources, and they are also recognized as a you know colorful expression of nature. We all love forests, right? Now, the way they are recognized, how far we are ensuring its conservation and protection is something which the law and the policies relating to forests of our country have been struggling for quite a long time. Although they are recognized as uh, so-called the guardians and the protectors of the wildlife, and at the same point of time, they are also major carbon sinks so if you look in the bigger picture they're also the one which protects the so-called entire climate by ensuring the carbons are in the reservoir sinks because as you know the basic nature is that they inhale carbon dioxide and exhale oxygen but the thing is that the forests despite its you know colorful expression of so-called the nature, despite of uh, it being, you know, a beauty, it has certain economic value. And from the perspectives of, you know, not just so-called the recreational source or scenic beauty, it also ensures several resources for the mankind. However, in the last couple of decades, we have seen that the forests have been degraded in a very massive level. And I would say not just decades, in fact, the last century itself, forests have been cut in such a rate, unequal in the world, and they are, in fact, disappearing at an alarming rate. In fact, in India, it has been claimed that we have got vegetation cover of 19% of the total land area only which is against the accepted ideal of 33 percent in india and for internationally it's around 40 percent so our vegetation cover canopy cover is far less than that what we usually require now if you look at from the historical perspectives you know when it comes to forests you'll find its reference in several texts, Upanishads, Matsya Purana, even Manu Smriti. Rig Veda, in fact, it mentions various attributions of God in trees. The plants, they are regarded as possessing divine qualities with references to their healing powers. In fact, According to Hindu mythology, God Varuna, which is one of the popular deities of Vedic times, is related to forests. The Matsya Purana also says in one of its verses that one pond is equal to ten whales and one sun is equal to ten ponds and one tree is equal to ten suns. Although it was quite patriarchal, but still the fact is they are putting a lot of emphasis on environment especially with respect to forests even manusmriti also declares that you know cutting of the trees are offense is an offense kautilya in his arthashastra also imposed the duty of the king to guard and key plant forests for kingdom he in fact prescribes it as an important duty of a king and the edicts which are usually issued by the king, in fact, also includes forest which should not be burned, it shall not, and, and tree, trees shall be planted on both the sides of the roads. So now we have, in fact, this is coming from the time of Emperor Ashoka. We talk about this national highway uh, plantation policy of 2015, which talks about planting trees across highways. But Lord, I mean, uh, Emperor Ashoka long back clearly issued an edict that trees shall be planned on both sides of the roads. In fact, 
even in the British period, in the British rule itself, forests were well protected and guarded, although the objective was different. At that point of time, initially, you know, if you refer to some of the British era forest related literature, you'll come across that particularly the tribal people, so called the forest dwellers, other traditional forest dwellers also, they were the one who were protecting and guarding the, you know, the forests. However, during the British period, the rules were giving an indifferent attitude towards forests. It was during 19th century when there was a fierce onslaught on Indian forests because forests were treated as a source of revenue for the government. It was not treated as a natural source resource, but more of a revenue for the government. And that is the reason because of which forests were extens extensively cut to meet the needs of, of timber for shipbuilding, iron smelting, etc., etc. The oak forest, in fact, were also cut and shipped to England back then for the use of the English Royal Navy. The Indian teak of Malabar, for example, were not found so suitable for the shipbuilding that they started extracting it here from here. In fact, if you see the entire from 1600 to 1947, it was virtually a period when the forests were vastly damaged, destroyed, degraded, the vegetation cover started sinking. In fact, even during the two world wars that we had, Indian forests served as an for the Imperial Army a great source of timber. So in order to serve these imperial cause of the Brits, the first Forest Act was enacted way back in 1865. But it was not to guard the forests. The Forest Department was established as per this particular law and the main purpose of that law was to facilitate the acquisition of the Indian forest areas to supply timber for several activities such as railways, even for industries and to establish the claim of the state on the forest land. However, this particular act of 1865 did not have any provisions to protect the existing rights of the forest living in the for, sorry, existing rights of the people or so-called the dwellers living in the forests. So basically this act was meant to regulate forest exploitation and management and preservation of the you know, forest resources was there, but from very economic point. However, there was no, you know, deterrent penal provision in this act because of which the act were not that effective. Therefore, uh, you know, a new debate arose at that point of time. And again, a new forest act was passed in 1878, which in fact claimed an absolute control and ownership rights of the states on forests. You know, the strangely at that point of time, this 1878 Forest Act, 1878-1878 Forest Act also recognized the rights of the nomads of the forests and other nearby dwellers. Basically, the customary rights in various areas were recognized. And these rights included, say, the rights of those villagers who were residing in Himalayan region, the tribal communities of Chhattisgarh, currently Chhattisgarh, the Santhals of Midnapur, West Bengal, the Bheel in Rajasthan, Madhya Pradesh. And their rights were pretty much related to grazing, collecting fuel, fodder, fruits, other forest produce, medicinal plants and herbs also, without having any proprietary rights. So 1878 forest right was in fact far more, you know, uh, rights oriented. However, that law was also not sufficient enough to make the forest laws more effective and to improvise this legislation. A very comprehensive act was enacted in 1927, which in fact repealed all the previous laws. This particular enactment, the Indian Forest Act of 1927, consists of around 86 sections divided into 13 chapters. 
The main objective of this enactment was to consolidate the laws relating to forests, to regulate and transit of forest, you know, regulation of transit of forest produce, and to levy duty on timber and other forest produce. But strangely, this enactment didn't define forests. But if you want to refer to the definition of forest, like what exactly is forest, then you should refer to this case by Allahabad High Court from the year 1988, Yashwant Stone Works versus State of UP. Yashwant Stone Works versus State of UP, the 1988 case where the Allahabad High Court adopted the definition of Food and Agricultural Organization, FAO, according to which a forest means all the lands bearing vegetative association demarcated by trees of any size exploited or not capable of producing woods or other forest products or exerting an influence on the climate or on the water regime or providing shelter for livestock and wildlife pretty comprehensive and this definition which in fact covered trees, its size, its late nature of exploitation, water, shelter of livestock, wildlife within it was further in fact taken to a new level in TN Godavarvan Thirumul Par versus Union of India case of 2006 where the Honorable Apex Court has made it very clear, had made it very clear that the term forest must be understood according to the dictionary meaning and it should be adopted, keeping in mind a very practical approach, which includes an area measuring to 10 hectares or more, having an average number of around 200 trees per hectare. So 10 hectares or more, and in an average 200 trees per hectare ought to be treated as forests. So it covers all statutory recognized forests, whether it is now, this is the thing. These are the thing that you should also keep in mind. According to the Forest Act of 1927, there are several categories of forests. Here I've mentioned three, but there is another category. Now, you have this reserved category, you have village forest, and then you have the protected forest. So, reserve forest, section 3 to 27 of the Forest Act deals with reserve forest, village forest from section 28. Protected forest, section 29 to 34. However, in addition to that, there is another forest, category of forest, commonly known as private forest or non-governmental forest. Now, when it comes to reserve forest, now basically these forests are declared by notification in the gazette by the government and in this reserve forests any kind of activities are strictly prohibited if you refer from section 3 to 27 of the indian forest act you will find that there is a series of so-called do's and don'ts with respect to reserve forest and if you want to de-reserve a reserve forest well then you have to refer to forest conservation act of 1980 where the state government can de-reserve a reserve forest only after getting due permission from the central government and central government can also form a steering committee to see because usually a part of reserve forest can be de-reserved or can be given on lease entirely also it can be but for what purpose you are giving if you're giving it for some non-forest purpose then it should be properly analyzed appraised and assessed by the central government from time to time and only on the basis of that and this has been enacted much later in the year 1980 to address several problems where state governments were giving away de-reserving reserve forest without taking into consideration several you know important aspects relating to that reserve forest while on the other hand when it comes to the protected forests the protected forest, certain forest which forest land or wasteland which is not covered by reserve forests are protected forests. These are basically government property 
there is certain powers of the state governments associated with protected forest and offenses are also there if you violate and you know when it, in comparison to reserve forest when it comes to protected forests certain activities are permissible however when it comes to reserve forests where the you know any kind of say what are the activities which are clearly prohibited in reserve forest well say for example clearing of forest setting fire leaving fire burning trespassing or pasturing cattle then causing damage by negligence and you know felling of the trees and uh, burning any trees or even quarrying stones cleaning or breaking up of the lands hunting shooting fishing uh, killing and catching of elephants all these are prohibited while on the case in the case of protected forest not all these are prohibited these are regulated these are in fact allowed up to certain extent while on the other hand when it comes to village forests these are primarily you know uh, in fact this is something which you should all know that when it comes to village forest these are basically assigned by the government by the state government to any particular village community so village community is the one who self regulated basically reserve forests are given to a particular village community or residing nearby or whose interests are involved in that particular forest produce the state government can through an official notification give that particular area of reserve forest to a village community and the village community usually regulate these so called reserve forests which are known as village forests and there is a mechanism commonly known as joint forest management and this is what the term is quite clear the state as well as this community who are ensuring a proper management conservation of the forests and finally there is a non governmental forests which in fact is also regulated uh, by the indian forest act uh, the, there is a power of assumption of management with respect to expropriation and protection at the request of the owner of the forest so even fire private forest is there in our country so we will just uh, i am making very short lectures because the, as i have already mentioned the uh, the limit for a video lecture is 50 mb in this website so i'll carry on with the other aspects and important cases and provisions relating to forest laws of india in my next lecture until then take care of yourself thank you very much